So when I left school, I really wanted to be a recruiter. Not. <laughs> I was like, well, f really? <laughs> this is Matt Brearley, founder and managing director of Retain, a man dedicated to building software as a service teams that deliver. Today in the potty, Matt discussed with the boys about how to build high performing recruitment teams and how to build an agency from scratch. You don't want to miss this. All right, Matty, well, thanks for joining us. Matty from Retained. It's good to have you at Confessions. Pleasure to be here. And so we're just talking off air then uh, around your relocation. You've got your office, nice little tenancy on Eagle Street, yeah. looking over the water. Very lucky. Super lucky. River Fire was amazing. Did you see it for River Fire? Yeah, so we, we ended up, well, we ran a little function there with mostly my family and all the kids and extended family, but it was amazing. Planes straight past the window. Epic. Awesome. It was, it was great. First time I've seen fireworks at the same level. Yeah, so true. So barge right in front of the Eagle Street office. It was amazing. Nice. Well, mate, you've got a really interesting background. I mean, we we're talking about all the SaaS, SaaS startups you've been doing, all the little tech plays that you've been doing. So you're obviously an entrepreneur at heart, which is awesome to see. Um, but recently, well, three and a half years ago, you started Retained. Is that correct? Yeah, so we're counting this as third financial year, just into the third financial year. So I left. I was at Talent on and off for 10 years or so. Yeah. Um, and then was, obviously you've got restraints as a part of that when you leave. So I spent a fair, to, fair bit of time in that next 12 months setting up other people's recruitment business for them. Yeah. Running systems and uh, getting all the processes in place and doing a bit of stuff that was out of restraint. Oh, so you're just consulting to new startups yeah. on how to get started, what to do. 100%. Do you, a lot of, when you're, in agency, you think you you know what to do and how to do it. Yeah, totally. And then you go out and do it and you're like, oh, shit, there's actually a <laughs> hell of a lot more involved. So much more. Usually <laughs> takes more money than you think and takes longer than you think. Oh. What what were, you, what were you, what was your biggest learnings or pitfalls that you thought, oh, I've told these guys to do this, but then it was your turn and you're like, I'm going to actually do this better or change this. Was there any areas of that startup phase that um, – that you're really glad you did or things you would have changed? Yeah, I think there's two categories there. One, when I was doing it for other people, so setting up for, for those. The, the conversations I, were, I was having with those business owners was they thought it was easy. So these are guys that aren't recruiters but are experts in their domain. Oh. So, for, exa for example, um, one of the guys owned an RTO, massive RTO at the time, um, was extremely convinced that they would be world dominant from a recruitment perspective over the next you know 12 months. And great guy. Brilliant marketer, this guy. Absolutely brilliant. But the execution bit, so getting the systems and the processes and even all the tool sets in place takes far longer than what you think it does. And we would get, and even though I've done all that a, a million times before, the reality is that when you go through and you do that, then you're going to discover all these pieces that you missed. So having a, having a, a good solid workflow and a, a set of tools that sticks together is, makes a massive difference. And were they successful? Are they still in business now? Yeah, they're still doing it. The RTO's changed. Was it world-dominating recruitment agency? <laughs> Not quite as much. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, um, I think the execution piece there, and it, you need to be so involved. And, th and that guy, honestly, is an absolutely amazing business owner. He's done so much over the last 20 years. But he's very, he was very used to running that via third parties or via managers. And I think if you're going to kick off the recruitment arm, then it, you need to be arms deep in it to yeah. start off with. So I think what might be quite useful for the audience is maybe if you spend, you know, two or three minutes giving us a bit of context on your history through recruitment, where you're at today, what industry you recruit in and kind yeah. of, you know, where you're sitting right now. And then we can kind of work backwards and put the pieces of the puzzle together. Yeah, no chance. Yeah. So when I left school, I really wanted to be a recruiter. Uh, no. <laughs> I was like, well, fuck, really? <laughs> First time ever. Yeah. No, no one's ever said that, right? That was a good straight base. Oh, yeah, yeah. I've been working on that. Yeah. Um, no, a usual story with everyone else. I was at a barbecue and my wife at the time was in recruitment and all her friends. I was trying to work out what I wanted to do after we'd come back from overseas. So I spent a whole bunch of time um, doing small business consulting before I left and worked as a BA in IT, actually, in Unisys uh, over in the Netherlands. Um, and then came back and dropped into IT recruitment. I did... IT at uni, but never used it in anger um, and never finished. Genius, had about one and a half semesters left to go and all my mates quit and I thought that was a, an excellent idea, yeah. um, as always. Um, but then yeah, that was it, started at Edipro, um, have always been uh, in IT recruitment, but started as a perm only recruiter uh, for Interpro and then ran perm teams or perm recruitment teams for Interpro 
and then transitioned across to talent when my boss at the time left and came across. Um, but then always IT uh, and the whole mission of coming across to talent was I want to do contract and that's, and that's the focus. Talent's an exceptional business. What was it like? Were they just kicking off in Australia when you first oh, joined? so them? much fun. Yeah. So much fun. It's so much of a different world to what it was back then. That's what I love about that. If you look at them and what they've done over the last 10 years and even their exit, what, or Richard's what was exit. It? What made them so good? Well, you know what? I think at the start it was, how I think, how we're trying to be now. You can influence and you can change things easily. Back then when I started, Richard was still flying up once a month and when we went to lunch, he'd sit on reception. This is a guy who you know, sold out for <laughs> a significant number of millions Yeah, uh, you know, 10 years later, but it was that that quick. If you saw something you, could, you wanted to change or you wanted to improve, you could make that happen in a heartbeat. And the rest of it was culture and underdogs. We were the underdogs, but I think we had a moment in time there, especially at the start at Brisbane, where people just wanted to be there. Like I was hungry, super keen for money, crazy keen for money. And the only way you can do that is by building a, a big contractor book. How long ago was this? Just uh, So I think I started originally in talent. Um, so I came across in 2010, oh, okay. 20, 2009, sorry. Okay. Um, so they, they probably would have been... At the time, they were still four or five states big, um, but they would have been sub two and a half thousand contractors nationally. Um, and Brisbane had thirteen contractors when I started. So wow. Okay. So what 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 created the desire to go from Perm, which is probably a little less complicated, fast paced, a little bit cushier. Yep. I'd say um, than doing it like a fast paced contracting or what? Why did you go towards the harder job, so to speak. Uh, some of that was money. Yeah. And some of that was I like to do hard things. So all the guys that I was surrounded with at the time, not in Brisbane, but in Interstate for Interpro, all the big only contract billers. No one that was doing perm was, was billing serious dollars. Yeah. It was all contract. And that seemed harder and it seemed like a logical step. I mm -hmm. felt like I was okay as a perm recruiter and in hindsight I was probably pretty average. Would you say it's easier to build big numbers in contracting because you're rolling every month and you've just got to add them up, add them up? I think it is. Yeah. But I think, it's, a, I think it's, a, it's an art form to some extent because I think you can get to four, five, six, well, at least eight after COVID. You can probably get to 700 grand as a contract recruiter without needing to set the world on fire. How many people <laughs> would you place to get 700K GP? Seven, 700K? Yeah. Uh, you'd probably be circa about... 30 or so. 30 contracts. 30 or 35, yeah. Yep. Depending, so on your, depending on your portfolio. So how do, you, how do you work out the value of a contractor? Is it just, you know, whatever the margin is times however long the contract is, you can say, yep, this is a 50K placement. Yeah, so we'd, um, I times it by 18.33 <laughs> as, as a weird old number. But we, we work out projections, right? So if you've got 20 out, 20 out on site, just over the years, 18.33 a month tends to work out. So whatever the daily margin is, times that, times uh, for how many months it is, and you can estimate. Okay. And then the, the levers that you're pulling are the logical commercial levers. So it's how many can how many can you fill? What's your hit rate? What's your average daily margin? And what's your average tenure? Ten, yeah, that's so a big one. Tenure so would... Tenure makes a difference. Yeah, yeah. So contractor management. Yeah, so, con so contractor management. So, a again, people especially contract recruiters, get too focused on the next deal, the next deal, the next deal. But the reality is if you can push them out to 18 months or two years, that's the only way to build a big book. Mm. Yep. <coughs> you, you won't have enough time. And your biggest year was 2.2 million yeah, as so a contractor at Talent. Yeah, so year of COVID, actually. So that, that was the financial year that we had COVID. Wow, <laughs> so 2020. Yeah, so 2020 into 21. And then, um, it's 20, no, 20, sorry, financial year 2020. You're yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. COVID-19. <laughs> um, but we went through a period there where I think at the time I had, um, so as an individual contributor, I had just over 120 out um, at the time. And then I think I terminated 55 or 60 contractors in two days. Wow. Over the top of COVID. What was that like, getting those calls? Yeah, not, not good. Not fun. Yeah. How did you feel in that moment? I'm, I was actually fine with it because it's, you've just got to empathise with them. It's not me. You can't think about yourself. Mm. You can't think about your own your own progression. It's about being empathetic. And people expect it at that point in time. But all we, all we could do was help people and be ready to redeploy. 
Okay, so your biggest year was? Did you say two point two million? Two point two million. Two point two, including the including the terminate. So we terminated all those, and I still did, I did two point two. What year. would you have done if they stayed on? Uh, three something. Nah, I, I don't think it would have been three. I think it would have been less, but it would have been I don't know two eight, two nine maybe. So so two point two is your biggest year. Yeah. What's your second biggest year? Uh, one point one point eight. Okay, so it's not a massive jump from your previous yep. um, biggest year. What's your biggest year before that? Oh, so to clarify, so two point two, the year before that was one point four. Okay, but the one point four was from zero. Okay, so I came back zero contractors, zero dollars on the board, and from that moment did one point four in contract. H- how? Uh, a lot of work. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> to me, what, that makes a, lot, a lot of a lot of muscle. <laughs> yeah. Because because I'd come back at the end there. I was again. I was laser focused. I don't care about anything. Did you get like PSAs, tenders? Oh, it was government. No, it was a mix. It was yeah. a mix. So as as people left that business, I picked up existing accounts, but not not contractors. That's not how it works. Um, but a lot of that was um, picked up old relationships. So you're you're coming into a business that you've already worked in. Yeah, you've got a whole year ahead, and you're yep. starting with zero. Correct. What's what's the first things you that you start doing to to then finish I the year at one point four? That's like. Everyone's dream as a recruiter, but yep. a lot of them have limiting self beliefs, various different factors. Um, why some of them can never get over four hundred k. Yeah. So um, you do what you know a lot of people do the profession for. But what was that character change? Did you have you already done it in the past? So you're like I can do this again. No, I'd never done. I'd never done a million when I walked back in the door. So I tried a couple of times previously at Talent. I, I topped out at eight eighty nine hundred for a couple of years running, which is painfully close. <laughs> Um, but but coming back um, again, laser focus. I'm going to do a million bucks. I can tell you exactly what I did. It's yeah, a, it, break it, it down. It's, it's a it's a big business, and so um, but at that moment in time, I think we were we were probably twelve or thirteen in branch. Most of the stuff's got names against it, so I literally just ran through the database and scraped every single old contact and old client I possibly could over the last ten or fifteen years and just worked it. Because I had nothing to work, and as hard as I possibly could, and then I took the scraps of whatever else came in, and I just worked the absolute backside off it. And people get discouraged at that point, I think, and they don't want to work it because it's a crap role, or you don't think you're going to fill it. Okay, so so you've jumped into the database, you've sorted by last contacted, maybe. <laughs> Pretty accurate. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty accurate. <laughs> yeah. On the client. Sort side, by last contacted and go. I'm yeah. going to start here. Yeah, hundred percent. Okay, and so so what was your activity like? And if, if we could just like paint a bit of a picture on your first 30 days of getting into the role ab- and how you built the momentum to get there, you've sorted it by last contacted. What was your activity like? I'm not yeah. sure that I can name the numbers, but it was, it was just outbound. So there's, there's two components to that. One is there were names on that database that I dealt with the last time that I worked there because I was gone for about two years or so doing other things. So I hit up those guys immediately. I, there was one account that I got given that we didn't have anyone in but was a legacy one for me. I spent a bunch of time there to go and build that up really quickly. Um, and the rest of it was just outbound, hey, you haven't spoken to us but you might remember us. What's happening? Let's go have coffee. It was just try and get out there as much as possible. And then from there, the, the change, so we picked up a couple of clients from that. The other key change was I think we had a couple of people move around in branch as well too. Um, and so I picked up a couple of legacy accounts, a couple of legacy government ones, but the attitude was still the same. Just methodically map that client for every single person that matters and then just desk by desk, old school, desk by desk. Um, okay, so your original approach, I'm, I'm just trying to pretend, I'm trying to t- um, absorb the ethos and, and the persona of a, of a recruiter that's maybe three or four years in, they're billing four, five hundred k a year. They want to hit a million bucks. They're at a big agency. They want to figure out what the habits, the actions, the mindset is required to break through this glass ceiling and hit a million bucks. Yeah, right. So if you're doing five, yeah. If you're doing so, the difference between five and seven fifty is usually the quality of your search. So it's PD, PD interpretation. So yeah. the accuracy of your PD interpretation, the the uh, pattern of your search and your speed to market. People will often top out far too early in contract, and and. They lack the intensity to actually get the numbers. So some of our LinkedIn searches, and this sounds ridiculous, but some of our LinkedIn searches will have two and a half, three thousand records hidden. How, so what do you mean? So if we're going, we're searching for a project manager, 
that means we've we've gone through and we've followed a process where we've looked at two and a half thousand records, trying to scrape out the top eighty or ninety in terms of that. If we're getting that big, we're probably panicking, or it's probably a niche role. Yeah, but it is the depth of what we have to do that makes the difference. And between five to seven hundred, that are you looking for the right piece? Can you interpret? Can you be fast enough? And can you be intense enough? Can you just ring more people? People, I think the market has changed significantly over the last 10 years or so, but we're so text-based and so email-based and reliant on LinkedIn. But the reality is you can't tell unless you get them on the phone. Okay, so uh, all right, so let's say you, you've gone through your database, you've called the top 10 clients that you haven't been spoken to in three and a half years. You call them up, you say, hey, let's go for a coffee. You guys might not remember us, but we've helped you in the past. Sure. You go and meet the hiring manager. They give you a few roles. Like, what are the KPIs that you probably set yourself internally? Because uh, when you say intensity, that means different things for so many different sure. people. Yep. So your version of intensity would be really interesting to, to understand whether it's, okay, I've gotten a role in at 10 a.m. and I'm going to pump out 30 calls, see what my outcome is, adjust my search, pump out another 30 calls, see what the outcome is, adjust my search. Like, what what is the, like the practical steps that you take when you're trying to apply your intensity in your search? Yeah, so two different categories. So one is if we're, if we're a competitive, we're released on a panel, we'll treat that differently. Um, if we take the use case that you just went through, then I'm, I'm pushing myself to... So if I'm doing a LinkedIn search, I'm pushing myself to get through a minute, minute and a half per page on LinkedIn because we're trying to do top of funnel to keep it, to keep it high level. If, if we're in a competitive search then, and we're in a cover phase... So what I would classify as cover. What's cover phase? So um, actually run the use case where it's we've been released the government role. Okay. So if, you, if you're one of four agencies or one of five agencies, we're on a panel, we've released it. We run a process that's we used to call the Mad 10, which is now probably half an hour. Um, but we still operate in verticals, technical verticals. But the reality is if we get a BA role in, then we'll put all nine or ten of us on that job for the first half an hour. So we've got a set process in terms of uh, who's doing the search, Who's ringing the hot list? Who's uh, who's ringing the last um, twenty people from the last three or four jobs that that matter? And who's doing the LinkedIn search? All that is defined in terms of roles. Interesting. But when we're doing a cover phase, we might only spend a minute or two minutes on the phone with them at the start, because all we're doing is we're we're looking to cover that market, and then the real recruitment happens later on. So we we may well be in a situation that in that first half an hour we'll we'll speak to eighty people. Wow. So we'll speak across to all ten of your yep. your consultants. Easy, you'll Easy. pump the phones. Easy, 80, 90. Like ideal would be a hundred people if we can get it. And then what you're trying to do is you're just trying to help your mate out. So it's you're helping the guy that sits next to you in terms of that muscle. There's a defined process there for how we're then following up and emailing all that. And the real recruitment happens after that. They need to qualify them and go through that proper process. But it, if you're talking about pure cold-hearted contract recruitment. Mm. It is that intensity that is speed to market wins. Now, there's always one person from that mix, usually the account manager that owns it, that should be ringing the people that we know, the ones we know that are right. You you have to divide the the roles and responsibilities up. Otherwise, everyone's just ringing randoms. Where did you learn this? Is this like, have you coined and, and reshaped this strategy for your own business? Or is this something that you learned in another business? Or like... No, it's a process we put in place for at talent. Um, and we were doing it one format or another almost from, I don't know, maybe a couple of years in. Yeah. Purely based on the fact that I don't like to lose. And we were getting dusted all the time. Just pure speed to market. Um, and so at that moment in time, and that's probably maybe 2010, 2011, we were, we were still underdogs trying to be <laughs> hyper competitive. Um, but everyone kind of got along really well very comparable skill levels and experience levels. And we just came up with a system to help. Now that got process driven and it got formalized later on in the journey. But that intensity made all the difference for us. And it's just win at all costs. Well, it's just, I think it's play hard, but play fair. I think part of that is if you're ringing people and they're, and they're covered, then you're not trying to steal them. Mm. Um, Would you be doing splits in that? Like if, if, no I'm, splits. if I'm banging it out, then I get Joe Bloggs next to me. It just deal. comes back around. No splits. Yep comes around got to got to help how many times would this happen per day 
So now we're we're only what I classify as medium volume at the moment, but from uh, when we were high volume before I left talent, probably um, five or six times a day. Wow, okay. So you're, you're engaged in a search and then half your day is like, we got to cover, quick. No, but the thing back then, because we were, we were bigger and more um, slightly further in front from a candidate pool perspective, it was only 10 minutes. You can't, you, everyone can help for 10 minutes. Hmm. But what's going to happen? And you've got meetings if you're there and you're not there. Okay. But the the reality is that um, that was that was the rule. You had to help for at least ten minutes. All hands and, on deck. Yeah, and that means that Declan might only ring four guys, but he knows four guys that are perfect for that role because he he worked the same role three months earlier, and he's just going to ring those four for you. But there's no splits. You got to help each other. You know, Could you run that in a perm environment? Oh. I don't know. I don't know whether or not the intensity is there. Is it from a perm perspective? And I can. And, and we're ninety five percent contract as a business, so I can barely spell the word perm. Mate, in, in my last agency, I, I I'm, I'm trying to square this up from a cultural standpoint. But in my last agency, I I would remember a consultant would get a job on, and then someone else would be like, "Boom! I know three people. It's perfect. Send the three people to that person," and that person would be like. I'm not going to consider your candidates because I don't want you yeah. to have a 50-50. Yeah, that was a culture shift after a while. When it was just us, it used to happen all the time. What? And then, that, like, I reckon it used to, we, we used to be really symbiotic and everyone used to be all in. And then a couple of people just started and then it changed yeah. the whole yeah. dynamic. Like, it is oh, a culture no. thing, though. Yeah. It is, yeah. But it's a trust thing as well, too. And if you're the guy that doesn't help, <laughs> then you can't really expect to get help back. Get help back. But there's, um, I'm not sure that, so there's an element there where you can set those guidelines and those rules as a business owner, but the reality is it has to be peer enforced. You, you, you don't want to be dictating in yep. terms of that. It should be that your peer is like, hey, come on, like I gave you a hand. And th- like there's no bottom drawing candidates. There's none of that. It's just you should be helping each other and be happy for the other guy to do a deal. Mm. Um, but, but that intensity matters. And there's a lot of other agencies that operate on that basis now as well too, especially on the the big government panels. Um, But it makes a difference. So there's there's that element of speed to market that makes a difference. So how many candidates are you hoping to have submitted by the time you get that job in? Is it the same day? No, no, no. So we usually, it'd usually be three-day turnaround. Okay. Absolute max, three-day turnaround. But on, on, on day one, you should, we should run it, we should cover, we should get emails out. The account manager should circle back in the afternoon to follow up. And then we run a, we run a process for the morning of day two. So for day two, you'd be in eight o'clock or whatever. Clear the emails, clear the LinkedIn, make sure your workflow's up to date, and then hunt everyone that you've covered that hasn't come back to you. So go back and call them again. So you got a gap here. So we we covered twenty people, and only five came back. So once you've tied it all up, the workflow looks right, so you know where you're at. Then from a discipline perspective, bring the other 15 as fast as you can before some other agency steals them. Okay. And qu- and qualify them then when you've got them on the phone. When you've done that, go back and qualify properly the people that have returned to you so that we can make sure that they're, they're the right people. You're never going to submit more than three anyway. Because I reckon that's one of the biggest missing pieces. Most people just download off Seek, send one message and be like, oh, they didn't get back to me. I'll just and keep move going. On. Oh, I think you're right. So, yeah. so we, we have, and we use job adder, but we've we've got... A, a process or a workflow that's about four miles wide, <laughs> but but each of those steps is planned out. So there's a we did this, we have the template set out, and then there's a stage where okay, then there's a column for a lock message to call back, and then there's a set email that goes out, then there's LMTCB two, then all of that is a, it's a constant contact. I was using the example the other day with the, the, the guys. I just bought a couple of products, SaaS products, for us as a business. I reckon those guys would have reached out to me. 10, 11, 12 times. I've ignored every single put. I've never spoken to them, <laughs> never responded to an email, never picked up a, a phone call. And then at the end of that, I'm like, I really need this. Yeah. Who's that guy? <laughs> yeah, mate. 100%. Who's that guy? And so I'm not, aff- and, and maybe that's also because we're in sales, but I'm not offended by someone continuing to email me and do all that sort of stuff. That's, that's fine. You know, that's what I say to rookie recruiters. Uh, when they first start because a lot of the the mental shift that they need to go through is uh, they feel like they're a pest yeah with the volume of follow-up get back to them get back to them call them again see if they're on the phones and when you haven't been in recruitment before and you get instructed to call someone again the following day they feel like they're harassing someone yeah 
And um, I, I tell my guys all the time, you want to call them as much as you can, their colleagues as much as you can, all their other colleagues as much as you can. And ultimately, if they're sitting in a boardroom talking about, oh, Cheryl's just resigned, you want all of them to have a bit of a joke and go, who's that person that keeps harassing us? <laughs> and someone will be like, oh, is that Amy? And they're like, yes, yeah. Amy, she keeps harassing us every week she calls. Let's just give her a crack. Yeah. And then boom, you're in. And there's a balance there as well too on the client side. But the persistence around me buying these SaaS products is a great example. Yeah. Like, there was zero engagement from me. Yeah. But at that point in time, I'm like, okay, I really need that. But I think there's a big focus on follow-up in the industry for clients, yep. but not candidates. No. I think you're right. Yeah. And that's how it's clear because we build these massive databases. Everyone says they have these huge databases, but their candidate placements are like 50 a year, oh, totally. 30 a year. But they've got 80,000, 90,000 candidates in their database that they yeah. never talk to. Yeah. And the difference is now the market has significantly changed even since COVID. So if you look over the last year or two years, even as an IT contract recruiter, to some extent, you could get away with sending one or two that were pretty close and demand was so high that you'd, you'd make a placement. It's, we're just not there. Currently, not for Queensland and not for Australia-wide. It's, it's changed. The reality is if, you, if you're not chasing and following up, you're going to lose on a candidate side because mm -hmm. someone else will. Do you know how many placements you make from your CRM in comparison to hunting new candidates? Uh, no. And the reason for that is we, we track data outside of the CRM at the moment, mostly because we run a process, an open to work process that we use job out of that distorts all the data. Oh, so really? I don't know the answer for that, but so if you're running, so for example, if you're running a vertical market for project services and you look after PMs and BAs, then we have set searches over the top of your patch on LinkedIn, on recruiter and then alerts. And then we run a process using the VAs where We'll go and track that back once a week. We'll import them into job adder, and then we'll get an understanding from everyone who's just turned themselves on to open to work. What does that look like? What are you really looking for? And what's happening? Mm. So there's um, an open to work feature in job adder. Yeah. No, 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 we, we created it. Oh, so we just ran a, We just invented a process and you just tag them as open to work. Yeah. So we, we created a job that's called open to work for that open to work project manager. Yep. And we use that for talent pooling. So Everyone dances around with that concept of hot lists and talent pooling and all that sort of stuff. It's just that we do it a little bit more on a regular basis. Mm. Once a week? Once a week they process it. Yeah. Well, this is probably a good segue then into to VAs mm. because the future of recruitment is, is always getting improved from either VAs, technology, whatever it is. High-performing recruiters are trying to delegate as much of the administration burden as they can totally. um and so so your structure of your business do you want to walk us through your consultants your vas who's responsible for what and how that workflow happens yeah so we, we've got effectively with everyone 360 in in brisbane so there's five plus me um offshore we've got three the logic there is they should use those we call them candidate managers offshore as force multipliers so uh, in general it's the account manager's responsibility to control traffic but your candidate managers will do a lot of the emailing, uh, so the templated email, the chase up, a lot of the initial bulk calling out. Their mission there is just to get an interested candidate on the phone with the account manager. That's it. Yeah, that's that's the focus. They're not doing a high level of qualifying. They're not doing any client stuff for sure. They'll do all the CV prep. They'll do all of our reporting, and all of our data stuff gets done over there as well too. The rest of there's other bits and pieces around bookkeeping that's done there. So would they source candidates, reach out to a candidate, yep. and then book them in for a call with a recruiter? Correct. Interesting. Do you have any in information around how many placements uh, you're making from them sourcing the candidates? Yeah, and with varying hit rates. Yep. And and it's a bit hit and miss is yep. the answer with that. So again, we're pretty heavily process driven, but um, there's one of the guys that's been with me almost since the start. Um, so. We could easily chalk up that there's 13 or 14 contractors that live purely because he sourced them. Awesome. Um, and so there's obviously a cost differential between Australian candidate managers. H how much do you pay these VAs? Yeah, so we're, it's around about uh, just over two grand a month. Okay, yeah, that's about right. Um, and they're an amazing ROI. Like yeah. the, the amount of time and space you get back from uh, them pushing hard uh, and finding people for you. I find that sometimes 
getting a VA for a, a, a consultant actually pushes them to go harder because they need to make sure that, you know, they're not letting the VA down. Yeah, so there's an element of that. I think the danger is, well, and probably we need to change the balance of what we're doing. Um, the danger is that you lull account managers into a false sense of security. Yep, that's what I was about to say. And then, oh, no, I couldn't find enough people. And, you know, I know the candidate managers rang everyone. There's always going to be a lower hit rate in terms of response mm. to someone who has an accent, no matter how minimal it is. Um, and the sad fact is that they can tell that. So there's a level of scepticism there or there's a whole bunch of scams going around and, and people are wary of it. But the thing we've got to worry about is that typically it used to be you, you would only get a candidate manager when you had more than 35 out. Mm. That was always the rule because you should be able to get yourself to 35. Yep. Then when you can get there, you can get a candidate manager and that's when you're going to go from a 650, 700 up from there. Um, so I don't know, it's one of the things that we need to think about is whether or not we're doing the right thing or the wrong thing. There is a force multiplier and there is an advantage there from an admin perspective, but if we're too reliant on them and we're not following up, then it's a problem. Also, I find the recruiters don't know how to communicate with them, don't manage know how them. to manage them well. Yeah, that's fair. Yep. I think that whole delegation element and especially if you're um, a recruiter that's only got three or four years experience, you may not have had that before. And then on top of that, you're layering a remote resource rather than sitting in the room next to each other where it's, oi, <laughs> have we done it? Yeah. Um, or you can hear it. Um, there's a big difference there. Yeah, and you think they're just the, the answer. They're just going to come in and plug and play. desk for you. Yeah, it just won't work that way. Mm. I think, and we, we have all of ours direct. Um, and again, there's, there's varying levels of success there. I think if I had my time again, um, and what we will look like is we'll try and segment skill sets a little bit more across those VAs. And we might look at using... Um, Perhaps someone like the Kesbys that run out of um, uh, run out of Philippines, but um, who are they? Uh, so um, uh, Fiona and Matt, I think their names are. They're both Australians, but Fiona used to be a recruiter. Okay, um, runs a big outsourcing business out of the Philippines. Um, he's done a stellar job. Brother Matt is an absolute legend. I've only met him once or twice, but he's he, super smart guy, um, and is doing a bunch out of there as well too, and doing a lot more in that AI space as well too. Hmm. So. Um, but I was just always really impressed by their approach and that, that background understanding of recruitment helps, I think, as well. Oh, for sure. And um, ha we were talking about relinquishing control in your agency. Mm. Were you nervous about bringing VAs to chat to candidates? Because a lot of people are quite apprehensive when they think of, you know, they're like, oh, no, we would just get them to source and couldn't imagine. But we have partners with X Recruiter that some of them bill 20, 30K a month. Yeah. And manage the whole process themselves. Yeah, I think um, I think there's a level of trust that has to go with that, but it's trust but verify. Mm. So you need to have processes in place to check that we're against the quality standards, and that we're making calls and that we're 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 in the right way. So some of that is we've got to monitor that, um, and you also need to expect that a there's a language difference or a call language difference, and b they're remote, so it's not it's never really going to be the same as having someone in the same room as you. Mm. So you've got three VAs at the moment. Yes. How many did you go through to like land on these three? Oh, that's a good question. Um, probably another four or five. Yeah. Um, and then we would have interviewed another 40. Yeah. And so do you just headhunt them on LinkedIn yourself and go, hey, you want to work for us? No, we use um, onlinejobs.ph, I think it is. Oh, okay. Um, it's like a Filipino website. Yeah. Mm. It's run by an American guy, but you can put an ad out on there and uh, like... In general, for a recruiter that's got, let's say, seven or eight years' experience, if you put that in the ad and you're very specific about your requirements, you probably still get 50 applications. Yeah, nice. Um, and there's, again, there's varying levels of quality, but yeah. we run video interviews and we test language skills and all that sort of stuff as well. Um, but it makes a difference. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. And then, mate, you were also mentioned um, you've had a stellar second year in business, 1.2 mil EBITDA, self-funded yeah. contract book as well. Yeah. How, like, was that a lot of capital to start to have a self-funded contract book? Did you start using a third-party provider and then wean off it? Or? Um, we started for about four or five minutes and then jumped off it. Really? Um, for no other reason. That, and great guys as well too. We're using Encore and Phil's an absolute legend. Um, but I was hyper-planned before exiting and had had a couple of decent years as well too and fortunate enough to be able to do that. Yeah. Um, part of that was payment terms. <laughs> so fortunate enough to for the first run of probably 
15 or 20 contract as well on seven day payment terms yeah, on contract. Yeah. and they actually paid it on seven yeah. days 100 percent. nice and then where we are across um the remainder of gov and gok and some of the commercials as well too where because it is self-funded we're 100 percent over the top of receivables mm. um so i run it not like a bookkeeper but there's a set format three times a week in terms of what needs to be done from a bookkeeping perspective and month end and management reporting and all that sort of stuff. Because that's one thing you you forget about. You're like, oh, I, Can I, be huge. I place a role in an agency and you get your comms every month or quarter and, and life's yep. good. And then you go out on your own and then you realise people don't pay you as quick. No, so think about it this way. If you were to put a contractor into um, Queensland Health uh, this week, um, 20 grand in cash is what you need, mm. no matter what. No matter on a, in a heartbeat, you've got to have twenty grand in cash to cover that for one placement or one place. Yeah, it's a just lot. for one week. Just no, d- no because Until your, you your payment terms. So no matter what, you're always going to be twenty grand in arrears. Yep. No matter what, um, and for the stuff that we do, which is usually project services and above. So d- how did you feel about that? Like a lot of people get a bit scared. They go, oh shit, I don't know if they don't pay, I don't know what I'm going to do. So how did you square that off in your mind? Did you just go, ah, it'll be fine, mate? Stupidly high tolerance for risk. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, yeah. Is the honest truth. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, th- that that behaviour has been pretty common for the last 20 years or more. <laughs> yeah, true. You know, if, you, if you're going to jump out and do a software startup with, with no, no parachute, you've probably got a risk tolerance. If you're going to build 2.2 and then throw it all away... You've probably got a risk tolerance. Yeah, yeah. Um, Not many people can do that. How did you? How did you just build two point two mil? Obviously, you'd be on a good wicket. Everything's going well for you. Life's life's pretty comfortable. Yeah, pretty stable, pretty secure. And then you pull the pin on the whole thing. Like, what was that like light bulb moment to go? Uh, oh, I'm going to go do my own thing. Yeah, look, great business, fantastic business, and and the prof services bit that I was doing a fair bit with it. So their, their side business, which is now enormous. Um, Fantastic guys, well run business, great. I just wanted something harder. And it's too easy for you. Is it, no, is it, well, I just want something harder. This this is harder, and some of it is about owning the asset, yeah, and the reality that it, that it is your asset. Um, but the rest of it is about wanting something harder and wanting to know what is the edge of what is possible. I'm fascinated by that and always have been, uh, and zero fear in terms of starting again from zero. Um, yeah, because you're able to back yourself and, and know your skills and ability. Totally. And, and even when you don't have anything to, to lose, then you know, it's, it's the best place to be in. What, what makes business so hard? Is it as hard as you thought it was bef- when you were billing 2.2? You're like, oh, shit, that's a challenge we need to go. Like, I think 2.2 was easier. <laughs> I think yeah. it was easier to bill oh, than 100%. what it is to do everything. Yeah. I think it's all the little things. So if you're running a big contract book, then you are very accustomed to task switching on a rapid basis. There's many a time there where it was everyone was queued up and you're like, yes, no, go, next, next, and do that. I think the variety of task switching, if you're running a business, is is broader. So whether it's not whether it's the tenders or whether you're doing the financials or whether or not someone else wants insurances or whatever it is it adds up and it's that overhead that makes a difference so some of what i'm changing at the moment from a va perspective is to remove the rest of that from me as much as possible so that we've got reporting by exception and i think if we can do that then the value where i need to be is back on the front yeah working roles again to some extent but but using the rest of my contacts to go and in work for the entire agency yeah so it's okay to do a as a rainmaker role, I think that's fine, provided you again we're not lulling people into a false sense of security. As a 360, you have to be able to catch and kill your own work. It's really interesting that you say it was easier billing 2.2 million than running a recruitment agency. Oh, definitely. And and I think a lot of people would get a little bit like freaked out about that because the thought of billing 2.2 million is challenging in itself. Sure. Um, so. So just to be clear, so the variety of switching between, you know, being the marketer, being the finance guy, being the recruiter, being the self-managing yourself to make sure that you, you know, you're doing the processes correctly. The recruitment manager. Hopefully. Yeah, the recruitment manager. Yeah. The variety of all of those skill sets, having to do all of them on a day-to-day basis is much more, is it more challenging, more draining? Like what is it about doing all those different tasks so difficult? I think it's both. I think it's all of the above. Because you, especially at the start, you still need to find time to recruit. Mm. And so you need to remove some of those. So I, I think I'm pretty heavily um, 
systemized and process driven and, and that w- that's always been about optimization. All I wanted to do was just be more efficient so we can build more. That's it. So especially when I exit, I'm like, I've totally got this. I'll, I'll just rewrite <laughs> all this from scratch. It'll take me like two days. Yeah, honestly, if someone had said, hey, if, if there was a bunch of stuff out there where it's like, look, pay 40 grand, we got every template you're ever going to use, every contract, all of your systems and your marketing. At the time, I would have laughed them out of the building. It's like, no way would I spend that now. Take my money. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Take my money. <laughs> yeah. Having done it, because the number of times we're like, we're still probably on version two or version three of docs that I know I can make as good as a version four or version five, and I don't have the bandwidth. It's funny that you say that because I don't know if you know what we do. <laughs> <laughs> no, totally. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so that wasn't that wasn't a fishing expedition, either, by the way. Yeah, yeah. I've massively just set you up there. That, that, yeah, that, thank that, you for that, mate. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to segue into ex recruiter now. <laughs> yeah. So no. no, because we have these conversations with the recruiters all the time, yep. and and there's usually it's like um, you walk them through. You know that that man hours, the bandwidth, the frustration, the, the 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 issues. The you'll spend a week on doing something, and then you'll realize a week later that it's all wrong. Totally, and you've got to d- spend another week doing it the, a yep. new way. And so I, I think it's it's funny that you've kind of said that out loud and said, "Look, if I was a recruiter and someone said that to me, I wouldn't have been like, dude, this is so much easier. Like, I can't believe you're charging that much for setting a whole business up.' And now. Going what you've got, going through what you've gone through to say, oh, that's a, that's a bargain. It's such an interesting mindset shift that business owners have coming from employee to employer, and they realise actually, I can see a good deal when I when I when I'm looking at one now because I've been through the pain and the struggle and the totally. and the trials and tribulations of setting up. That's hard, right? Because some of that is about trust or credibility, or some of it is about um, until you've actually had to go through it, you won't believe it. So I don't, I don't know what the answer is there, but even from someone who set up other people's businesses before doing this, then you would think that I knew. Yeah. <laughs> but it was still harder because you're under pressure to build and no one will put me under any more pressure than what I will. Uh, and then I have a distorted view of what's possible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because I, I still think that, that those numbers are all possible and that I didn't think it was that hard it was a lot of work but I didn't think it was hard um and so because of all that you're under pressure from 10 different directions at once and that's that's the difference yeah 100 percent. and so I think there's there's real value in having systems and tools and the baseline stuff done you may not fully understand that value until later yeah Okay, so if there are any recruiters out there that are interested to find out what it's like to have a VA support them in their role, whether that be to bill more, uh, reduce tasks that they don't enjoy doing, or be a more effective recruiter in their niche, then we definitely recommend reaching out to the outsource people or top. Reach out to them, inquire on how they can implement a VA in your agency and to support you. And if you mention X recruiter or confessions of a recruiter, they will give you a 13% discount off your bill per month on this VA that will allow you to scale your business, scale your desk, and to bill more and make more money. So go reach out to the outsource people, say Confession sent you, get your discount and see what is possible. Did you get any mentors or advisors or people you lent on or is it just, just yeah, crack on? I still know a whole bunch of people in the industry and um, I think in, especially in Brisbane or even in IT recruitment, then there's still a, um, there's still a, a bunch of people that have been around for 15 or 20 years that are, that are friendly, yeah, yeah, um, and some of that's weird. Um, so on that side, then there's still plenty that I talk to as a part of that, and some of those we have really interesting relationships. I mean, there's one as well too. We're on a client, and um, we'll do briefings together, but to the point where it's to some extent it can be candidate names out in the open together. And that's very unusual for competing agencies. Yeah, but that's the abundance mindset that you've got though. It makes no difference at all to me. Yeah. Makes and so no issue doing briefings with anyone else. No problems. Yeah. No issue sitting there talking about progress. It's a little unusual to start talking about candidate names in the open. How did you get to that point? Like was there um, t- certain terms of events cuz we're always telling recruiters like that's your 
sweet spot. That's what you want to work towards. If you can get there, then, you know, life's a lot better as opposed to this 1v1 all the time and scarcity mindset. Yeah, I, I think there's two things. One is I've never had a problem referring candidates to other recruiters. Um, it happens all the time. I'm pretty confident I've probably done more work from doing that than what I have of, of, of keeping it to myself. Yep. So I've never had a problem with that. Um, there's been a lot where I've done briefings before. With that particular scenario, I'd never actually worked or competed against that agency or that person before um, and then had met that person for a coffee at the start, um, got along, and I genuinely don't have a problem with it. It, do, mm. it just doesn't worry me. That when, when you're talking about that uh, candidate names out in the open or, or having an in-depth conversation about a role or where you're going to find them and target clients together, some of that is credibility. So I've been on briefings where it's like, hang on, stop. Did you say you've got that person, that candidate? Like, yeah, okay. That person's better than who I have. Now, the only thing, so we're not going to do the deal anyway. But the point is the level of credibility that you get from that with your client is through the roof. Mm. A, it's the truth. Yep. <laughs> that candidate was far better than what we had. And that person got placed and is still there two years later. Um, but it's honest and it's transparent. Yeah, And it's part of that, like one of the core values is transparency. Because there's such a big thing, and if you, if you think about that transparency thread, it's probably, you talk about limiting beliefs and, and where recruiters are struggling to go from a seven to a million. A lot of the time it's because we do, we all lie to ourselves. And, it, and it's just, and we're going through that process even from a contract recruitment perspective. How we're looking at that, with how I look at it with the guys, can be difficult. Mm. It's like, do you know what? If you are day three, and it's due at the end of day three, and it's 9 a.m., and you've got no one, then just say you've got no one. And then the, the guy's got me like a, a hoodie and a hat made up for my birthday. It says facts first, story second. <laughs> because the reality is that it doesn't matter. There's no weight put on current state. Mm. There's no weight put on it. It is what it is. Let's just get on with it. So if we're that. there, it's pure transparency. Who have you got? And then if you're talking me through who you've got as your short list, it's always the same. I'm going to, you know what red teaming is? Yeah. So so you, you're playing the opposing force. So when you're showing me your candidates, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to pretend I'm the hiring manager. And it's just like, okay, because I can I can read it. After 18 or 20 years, you can kind of get a quick skin to know if they're close or not. It's like, tell me what I'm not going to like. So what's your hiring manager not going to like based on the current CV? Cool. You're not trying to, we're not trying to exclude people. We're trying to find ways to put those candidates in. Mm. So what what else do we want more information on? When we're talking about making sure we've customised CVs or we've gone to the right level of depth to match the brief, that's a key thing. But it goes back to that transparency value. Just be crystal clear because the only way you can get to a million is to be brutally honest with yourself. And then and then part of that is you, you do retrospectives on your own role. I still do it on my own roles. What do you do for your retros? So retro would be like, okay, so where do we land? So two candidates... We got interviews, no deal. Y you're looking back to find the break point and trying to be honest about that. So is it that we weren't fast enough? So why weren't we fast enough? Is this oh, what you do for every deal or every time you, you do an assignment? Uh, almost every time. Wow, okay. That's pretty, so, that's pretty strict. But, but what comes from that is, is a really rapid process improvement. Yeah. Because what you're looking for is the actual root cause of the, and, it, and again, no weight put on it. So we weren't fast enough. So why weren't we fast enough? What's the actual truth there? Oh, we had too many roles on. Oh, okay. So there's not enough support. So we need to add candidate managers to make sure we support. Yeah. We weren't fast enough or we were fast enough, but we got the wrong people. It's because we can't interpret the PV fast enough. So we need to change that. We need to coach on that to improve on that. Or it was that we had the right people and we lost them all because <laughs> we didn't follow up. But it's trying to be transparent across all, all elements of that process because all you really care about is... is like, why, why do you want to work something for 20 hours and then lose? Totally. But the retro is about that, about transparency and about process improvement. Mm. So, because you've made a couple of new hires in the last couple of months. So, it yeah. seems double. Ainsley. Yes. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. The big Josh. fella. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So Wasn't Josh. he our first person on the pod? <laughs> I think he was, yeah. Yeah. No, second. Second, second, second. was he? Yeah. I think he thinks he was the first. He Well, he technically, he was first our first got advertised. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the first one we had to take offline because it was he a little bit fired. scandalous. Yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> No one talks about the first one. No. Um, <laughs> fair call. It wasn't um, our doing. No, no, no. Nothing to do with you. Yeah, no, so um, Five Plus Me, there's growth, there's different challenges that come from that. 
every business has got different ways of operating. Everyone's got different habits. Um, and it takes time to align and there's a lot of work that goes into that. So even though that we're, we're documented, we're process driven, the reality is the, the magic is in the day-to-day execution of that mm-hmm. and that takes time to align. But if we can get that consistent, then we win. And I suppose being able to attract good recruiters is leaning into you and what you've achieved. Yeah. How do you find recruiting for yourself though? Because that's something I always struggled with, struggle with talking about yourself, your successes, what you've done building up your own substance or yeah, persona. Yeah. Yeah. What what have you done that's been able to attract well, people or Well, I think I think especially at the start, you're you're often operating at the fringe because you're not going to have the pulling power of a major. Um and so you've got to hire on um you've got to hire on attributes and you've got to hire on intent. Um pretty confident I've got that as much wrong as I have right over the last two or three years. <laughs> so let's let's say I'm 50-50. Oh, mate, that's mate, probably that's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> I reckon I'm like 70-30, <laughs> maybe 80-20 to be honest. <laughs> Do you know what's interesting with that though is, is and I still haven't formed that theory up, but, and we used to call it the recruiter's brain. But when we're hiring, all of the hiring that, that so the team that I built of talent was all off the street. Yeah, so, I remember you saying. So now you've got guys that are still there doing three mil. Wow. And another guy is close to two. And and a whole bunch of other legends that have moved states or still with that business, none of them had any experience. So the, the complexity for me is to refine that in terms of how do you find that in humans? Like how do you, you can't advertise for that. Mm. And so some of it is about finding those patterns and often like I'm usually looking for people from, um, you know, from a real estate or from a gym sales or from a competitive sports background or something like that. Mm. And then you, you're trying to test as much as you can for intent and what those core drivers are. But there's a book called Attributes by Rich Devinney, I think it is, an SAS guy. Um, I think there's a there's a core of a concept there in terms of how to use that then to attract your people. And that, that comes from making sure that you've got your values clear um, and you can communicate those and that you can somewhat sell the dream of, okay, well, you could go somewhere else and you could go work with a bunch of guys that talk about you billing million bucks or you could go and work with someone who's done it. Yeah. One of those two. And, and work with someone who's done it and taking people off the street and made million dollar goals. Yeah. And, and, that's, and look, there'll be a million mistakes made over the next like year or two years anyway, but we will get there. Yeah. And well, we will produce million dollar billers. What was your quickest time to take someone from zero to a million well, bucks with yeah, no experience? Yeah, so um, I think the answer to that would be that it, that still took quite a while. Three years, so, four years? No, so I left in between. So um, one of the guys I used to work with um, had never done a mill either, but was my candidate manager originally. Absolute legend of a guy. Um, and um, that first year that I came back to talent, again, laser focused. I don't care about politics or anything else. I'm just going to go build a million bucks. Um, and that was like a fairy tale. We both did it in the first year. Um, but I think that was probably his third or fourth year as an account manager yep. from memory. Yep. Um, so he's hanging out with me as a candidate manager for a year or two. Um, but again, if, if you could synthesize like his attributes, then that that's what we're looking are for. They, are they just watching you? Are they being your shadow? Like, I think because it's a high volume contract as well too, you're second by second in the trenches with them all the way through from the candidate manager perspective. You sit next to each other, you're vetting, you can hear them on the phone. There'd be 50 coaching points a day in terms of that. And so I'm, I think very much there's a lot of this going on. There's a lot of talking going on. Um, I think if you're going to be um, an account manager, the candidate manager or, or some sort of coach that, that isn't talking that much or isn't course correcting, I think you're missing opportunity because I think people will fill the gaps as they best know how. Um, and, and again, if you can find the right attributes, people want to be better. Wouldn't you want to build? 100%. How much fun is it to go and do a million bucks and get paid oh, for mate, it? Oh, mate, recruitment <sighs> sucks when you're not doing well. Oh, that's terrible. Yeah, yeah it's the worst <laughs> yes. job ever. Yes. Yeah. It's different, different types of problems, right? But, but, you know, there's the stress that comes with not being busy. Yeah. There's the stress that comes with being busy. Um, but I think if we can constantly focus on that, that improvement aspect, then being busy is 10 times more fun. What about, what about the future of retained? Like, you're three years in... You're three years in business now. Yep. What is it? What are, what are the goals? What are the aspirations of a business owner that's running a great recruitment agency 
It obviously hasn't got a worry in the world and <laughs> everything's going Let swimmingly. Me know when you find <laughs> yeah. Let me know when you find <laughs> yeah, him. Yeah. Like what, what are the goals and aspirations of you now, now being three years in business? Like what are you f- really focused on in improving or getting to? I think make it real so that it doesn't need me. And I don't mean that I'm going to leave or that I'm going to be hands off, but making it real in my head means that we run a tribe model and that your you tribe is self-sustaining. So you'll have a lead and enough people coming up through the ranks that there's always a coaching element and admin support and some marketing support. So create two tribes in Brisbane, run a GM, do interstate. So do multi-state. I used to run multi-state consulting. I know how hard that is. Everyone thinks it's 10 times easier than what it is and, and people screw it up all the time. Mm. But, um, but the goal has always been to find what the edge of possible is with that. Um, and I think that's that would be new for awesome. me. Yeah, yeah. Um, have, have you have you got like t- kind of timelines or you like oh I'll, I need to I need to do this first, then this, then this, and in five years I'll I'll get here. Yeah, or? some some of it's opportunistic. So it was always going to be make sure we have fully one fully sustainable, fully billing tribe by the end of this financial year. Cool. And to okay. start and to start on that second tribe, so that by the end of next year we could be interstate. Awesome. And interstate means either the only way we'd do interstate would be either to acquire something or to have a, a GM or, or a lead that has some who, who want part of the business. What does a tribe consist of? Uh, so it should be a, a, a practice lead, two seniors, an account manager, and some candidate management support. Gotcha. Okay. So you're talking, you know, six to eight people? Yeah. So six, maybe we'd run a shared admin over the top, but at, at six, you'd be looking to try and get three mil out of the po- out of a tribe. Yeah. Three mil in terms of GP. Yeah. Um, and and again, old school figures, one and three. But if you can build a model sustainably that that will give you a mil worth of EBIT per tribe, and repeat that, then happy days. Yeah, I'm still. Haven't done that yet, but <laughs> <laughs> that's the idea. But, yeah, but, well, th- but those figures are sustainable. They're just not easy. Yeah, I, I think that the biggest challenge, like in theory, all this stuff is quite easy. Like if mm. you can kind of break it down to like, oh, we just need this and that and this. And then, you know, on average, you'll probably produce this and we're all good to go. But it's all those little life curveballs that just get thrown at yeah. you from a business standpoint that uh, sometimes it's not as easy as the theory or like the the naive recruiter thinking oh mate 40 grand to set up a business geez that's i could do it for two thousand bucks in a laptop what totally. are you talking about totally. and then all of a sudden you go through it and you're like mm, okay I'm, I'm i'm learning things that i never yeah. knew existed oh there's still so much more to learn there's, there's so much more and i've got an advice so i pay to be part of an advisory board so you might call that business coaching okay yeah but we do that once a month and that it's, again, it's transparent. All figures are up. You're talking about what your issues are, what your goals are, what the roadblocks are. And, and my expectation of that is to get pushed. I want people to ask harder questions. What's the hardest question you've got to ask? Um, why? <laughs> it's been a lot of questions about why not, why not accelerate? Why not go faster? Oh, yeah. Um, why? Um, so there's, there's, there's a, one of the guys there is of the opinion to push a lot harder, but and like get a GM now, just go and hire another five guys. Why can't you just go do BD, do nothing else but do BD, get a GM, go and do it? Can you make it work? And to me, that's too much. I think it's at the edge at the moment with five plus me that we need to align for anyway. I think if we're if we're another forty or fifty contractors out, then no matter what you've got bandwidth there and safety, so high, very high tolerance of risk but still probably hyper Reasonable. I, but, but I think I'm <laughs> hyper-disciplined. No, hyper-disciplined on the dollars. Yeah. So even if you think about it, so we're, um, we're ahead of the curve and ahead of the legislation for where we're payday super and all that sort of stuff. Every single time we run pay run, all of our obligations are allocated into a separate tax management account. So we're, we're paid on a Wednesday or we're, we're paying contractors on a Wednesday, Wednesday afternoon, and we know exactly where our GST liability is, our payroll tax, everything's separate. So there's never any doubt. So no matter what, I'm never concerned about that aspect. But then part of me has seen it change so quickly before, whether it was GFC or whether it was end of oil and gas boom in 2011 or whether it was up. And we've seen businesses three or four times the size of ours crash and burn in six Mm. weeks or eight weeks. Now, there's probably a lot of other stuff going on behind the scenes that we never knew. But there's so many of those that have happened. Even at a time like I don't know, 
Boston Kennedy way back when in the day, like they were huge and it couldn't be stopped. Was that like go-to yeah. recently? Like, yeah. Like a year or two ago, like yeah. go-to was pumping. Collar. 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 Yeah. And and so I think... It well, Collar's actually come back out of it. Yeah. But it's hectic at the time. Yeah, yeah. totally. And so I think um, we're still we're still at risk. I'll probably always hold that. Mm. I don't mind taking risk, but there's, there's got to be a backup plan there from a financial perspective. So those hard questions. And then the other hard questions I get is, is and I, know I get pushed pretty hard on board as well too, is it, they're, they're just direct questions. Is the problem you? Yeah. Yeah, actually probably, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah probably yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. Every yeah. owner. Yeah. Yeah. What are you doing about <laughs> it? That, yeah. They're the sorts of questions that, that you're getting pushed on, but that's what I need. That's nice. How uh, long have uh, you been a part of that? Yeah. Uh, 18 months. What's it called? Uh, that's called Thought Pilots. Thought Pilots. Thought Pilots, yeah. Okay. Yeah, great group and, and all business owners. Um, it's got a little heavier flavour on the trades-based business um, in terms of owners on there rather than prof services or, or business. Um, or kind of re- there's no one else from a recruitment background. Um, but I found it valuable. Um, I think... The, the next phase of that for me is to do more stuff within the industry. Mm. So to go and find another five or six people that are the same sort of mindset from who own their own agencies and do something similar. Because um, I think there's still a lot to learn from a, how do you run an agency and how do you, how do you run a business as a part of that? Cause we, we have unique problems. Um, a lot of the problems are the same. Everyone's sitting there on board talking about money and sales and people and recruitment. <laughs> Every single every single time, it's all about <laughs> recruitment. They can't find the right people. True, yeah. Um, but a part of that is do you get leads from it. Yeah, we don't do trades. We only do IT. So true. We, we've done we've, we've had one or two leads, but everything else that comes from there, I steer in other people's direction. Yeah. Um, so I'll refer to people that I know and trust. Um, but yeah, not not for us. And we wouldn't we wouldn't step into that space. It's just not it's not my competency. It's you don't want to recruit a warehouse manager. Not right now. Okay. <laughs> Forklift driver? <laughs> maybe, maybe next. Ask me next week. Yeah. Um, no, but we're we're hyper focused on the IT space, and that's all we want to do. Yeah. Um, so I think from that perspective, it's easy. So taking that taking that board concept and trying to do something similar in re- in recruitment, I think, is valuable. But you got to find the right people because mm. not everyone wants to be that transparent. Not everyone wants to be pushed, even as an owner. Um, so there's still a lot to learn from everyone else. Mm. Um, so it's been a good journey. Bloody oath. <clears throat> and um, how do you keep that buzz or intensity with your new team? Even if they're they're coming up, you say you hire a recruiter that's post COVID and yep. used to everything falling in their lap. How do you re engage them to be like we've got to go hard, set the standards from the beginning? And yeah, I think that's been difficult over the last couple of weeks. Government kind of slow down for election, and we're still too heavily focused on gov. Um, then you've got gaps, and I think having clear processes and how you go about BD. And making sure that we're methodical about that it makes a difference in terms of buzz. When when we're on the tools and we've got stuff on the go, I think that Mad Ten process that we run, um, or Mad Thirty minutes in the moment, <laughs> we're not that fast, um, makes a big difference because there there is that buzz that intensity, and I'm still in the midst of it, ringing people and pushing and so we just and lead them from the front. Yeah, but, best way to do it. Yeah, but but also celebrate the little tiny bits like we're. Celebrate if you're getting an interview or celebrate, but making sure that, you know, we're doing interview prep two days before the interview. <laughs> like, don't, don't ring the guy 20 minutes before and try and interview prep him. Yeah. Or don't just leave it to the recruitment gods. Like, I think that's the other big thing as well, too, is we've always been focused on trying to do that last 1%, that last just one little thing more that's going to influence the decision. It makes a massive impact when you just do the little things right. Yeah, Everything flows so much easier. I think a lot of people don't realise that if they just do, if they just add a few little tiny one percenters in their process, they'll probably build 20, 30, 40% more. Huge, huge. And the difference from going like from a million to 1.4 million is very rarely fastest finger first. That's not like you are at a million or just over. You're probably moving at pace anyway. It is about then a completely different skill set. So not only ha- you need to look at the optimization along the way, but then all of a sudden it becomes all, you need to know what's happening before the roles come out. So you need to be able to understand projects and the phases and the actual business outcomes. And then you can have different types of conversations in order to scale. Mm. Because otherwise, 
because there's this natural inflection point, right? You're going to top out, you're going to struggle at 35 contractors, and then all of a sudden you're going to struggle when you get to about 70 contractors Yeah, because of your tenure. Because all of a sudden you're doing two deals a week just to stand still. In order to get past that, then you need to change that behaviour and change the way that you're operating, and that makes a big difference. But, mm. yeah, the buzz comes from that as well too. Love that. Mate, a lot of things that you've said today um, – uh, really good refreshers for probably a lot of recruiters that are that are thinking about how do I get from 400k to a million? What do I need to do to get myself out of agency and start my own business? Even agency um, agency owners right now are trying to go through the process of hiring staff, when to do it, how to delegate uh, with your VA. So it's all really really interesting. What we like to do at the end of our potty is ask our guests a question. Fire away. I'm not sure who wrote this question. <laughs> We're about to work it out. So, what's the weirdest reason a candidate got rejected for a role? Oh, that's an easy one. Um, rocked up and before the interview had his sunglasses on his head and had a can of V. And what that means is that he's a gamer and that gamers often start to three o'clock at night, so there's no way that he'd work well. Didn't drink, the, put, put the V in the bin, took his sunnies off to go to the interview, but saw him in the lobby waiting. Really? And then therefore was a gamer and therefore would not perform. Was he a gamer? No idea. <laughs> no idea. Plays a pretty high how did you over, How did you overcome that? Yeah. No, the, there was the, no overcoming it. I mean, you can't actually fire clients. True. <laughs> you fired the client. Yeah, 100%. Yep. So there was that one and there was one other one where um, we'd gone through four or five rounds of interviews for a first level service desk and, um, and struggling just to get it across the line. But struggling to understand why. And the comment back from the client was, just send me more. Like, I'm not doing that. It's not a chance we're doing that. So ring up and start to talk through feedback. And the comment was, <laughs> the comment was, um, I can't really give you anything other than that he was really an apple and I'm really looking for more oranges. I'm like, cool. Thanks very much. I think we should see other people. Wow. Um, but stuff like that just, and I think people work roles to death and people are afraid to ask for feedback. And recruiters are afraid to push back and stand their ground. Mm. Um, but you just, no one's getting paid. If you're running five or six, if you're working 40 hours in a row and you, you get five or six interviews and you can't get feedback, there's just no point. Yeah, no. 100%. Being a business equal, as quick as you can get to that phase is yeah. major recruitment. You can't do master servant relationship, doesn't work. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, right, Maddie, nice. thank you for joining us on Confessions, mate. It's been insightful, it's been fun. Hopefully you've enjoyed it and um, we'll see you in the next episode. Thanks for tuning in to another Confessions of a Recruiter podcast with Blake and Declan. We hope you enjoyed and got a lot of value and insights out of this episode. If you do have any questions or you would like to recommend someone to come on the Confessions podcast, we would love any introductions. And remember the rule of the podcast, like, share and recommend it to a friend. Until next time. Thank you.